And this is our essential question for today, brothers and sisters, is, you know, how can we better utilize instructional technology to improve student mastery of learning goals? We don't want to just use tech. We want to use it in a way that helps improve student mastery of learning goals. This is the, the SAMR model uh, that talks about how can we gauge to what degree we're using technology? Are we using it just as a substitution? for what we used to do? Are we starting to augment the task that we used to do with our use of technology? Are we modifying the task? In other words, is the tool itself working in a way that we can actually change the task into something that's more efficient, more engaging, um, fosters learning in a way that couldn't be accomplished before? And, and or are we getting to redefinition where the task we're actually engaged in could never have been conceived before. It was inconceivable before because of the we, we didn't have this type of tech and we're looking at looking at all those different depths but before we do let's keep in mind this this old testament story if you're familiar with it and he goes up the mountain to talk to god and by the time he comes down this is what they've reverted to which are these older practices that they used to abhor in egypt which is idol worship in this case they've created a golden calf a couple of lessons you might think about is it seems like when we're not being watched we tend to gravitate towards shiny things and be up to no good so one of our key roles as teachers is to help our students learn to use technology in ways that facilitate learning and in ways that are responsible because uh, the natural man or natural woman will tend to gravitate towards the new and shiny and utilize it in ways that, that aren't really productive. Okay? The other lesson might be is we just love shiny things. We just love shiny things. In fact, some are accusing your generation in particular of, of technology worship, of basically amusing yourselves to death. And I don't think that's very nice. But I'm very interested because I've been at the park with my kids and we're hanging out and doing, and I look over and there's this beautiful two-year-old kid who's just wandering around. I was like, ah, trying to get his dad's attention. And his dad's just on his phone like this. And I want to walk over there and say, hey, can I see your phone real quick? And go, Whoosh. just throw it, see what happens. Okay. We don't want to inundate our kiddos with any more unessential technology use. What we want to do is help them to utilize it in a way that helps them master their learning goals. Okay. Uh, I found this interesting in the New Testament where Paul goes up to uh, Mars Hill, he's talking to the Athenians, and they're interested in what he has to say. But this is what it says about why they're interested. It says, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Interesting. The only reason the Athenians and the strangers were there wasn't because they wanted to hear the message of Christ resurrected. What they wanted to hear was something new. They spent all their time just, oh yeah, let's learn about something new. It's cool, it's new, it's shiny. So this pattern has been around for a long, long time where we like shiny stuff. We like new stuff. Um, so here's an exhibit for you. Um, yesterday evening, I Googled um, top gadgets and here are some of them that popped up. Now, at the end of this, you need to make a decision. Which one of these do you most want? Okay, all right, so here, here are your options. Let's pretend this is on like Oprah or Ellen. I'm like, ah! look under your chair you get one of these okay whatever so here you go um, this is a little app and a plug-in uh, into your grill you can rig your grill to actually be smart control so that you can plug in a meat thermometer and from your smartphone you don't even have, you don't even have to be near the grill you can be walking around and check the thermometer uh, the the meat temperature and then also change the temperature of your grill because it's smartly connected to your phone you can grill without having to be at the grill yes Okay. okay, this is a smart trash can. Yes, you can walk by it and you can wave your hand in front of it and then the can goes mm, and opens. Then you can wave your hand over the top of it and it'll go mm, and close, which is really cool, kind of a Jedi mind trick. But even better is you can also program it to your voice. So I could say trash can open and it just opens because sometimes I've got like garbage in both my hands, right? Mm. And so I might need to use my voice to open and close. It. That's gadget number two. Ooh, shiny, love it. Okay. And then, brothers and sisters, uh, you have this recent development. This is the uh, blast-proof umbrella. This withstands gusts up to 75 miles an hour without receiving any damage. This is perfect for those of us who are living in windy places such as southeast Idaho. Okay. Uh, oh, check this out. Big screen TV. Okay. But not only does it go landscape, it goes portfolio because, you know, sometimes you take um, videos of your phone in portrait mode 
and you want to watch them on your big screen TV, but you don't want to watch portrait in landscape. You want to watch portrait and portrait. So you can change. I don't know. Okay. Um, this is pretty cool. Found this. This is a Furbo. In other words, it's a dog or cat nanny cam. So you can watch your your creature, your pet from wherever you need to, but also at the press of a button, it dispenses a treat if they're being a good boy, girl, dog, cat person. Thing. Okay. Last but not least, how many of us have been frustrated, not with only dull razors, but a cold razor. Oh, it's just so cold, it's just so cold. So this is a heated razor, brothers and sisters, guaranteed to cut better, but also with more comfort because it's not freezing on your skin. Okay, right now, brothers and sisters, I need you to choose which one is your new and shiny. Which one would you gravitate towards? Yeah, we love shiny things. We love this. And I, I'm a sucker for these types of things as well. This is not how we're going to approach tech, which is new thing. Got to have it. Got to use it. It's going to be, here's our learning goal for our students. This is the type of evidence we want to collect through our learning activities which tool or tools would help facilitate that in the best way possible. Remember our question was, how can we better utilize instructional technology to improve student mastery of the learning goals? Still starts with the learning goals. Still starts with where we want kids to end up and what we want them to be able to know and be able to do. And that's how we start to determine what tools will help us and more importantly them get there. Okay. So what's happened due to, in this case, COVID and you had, basically a chasm that broke. You had some teachers that were just like, I have no idea what to do. And they basically just stopped teaching the last two months or three months of the semester or weeks or whatever it was. But then you had some other teachers, public schools, also at your, in your university experience, that were able to keep it going and actually continue to facilitate learning effectively. But it sounds like there are three things that they had going on. One, they already knew what were the instructional practices that they needed to make sure were being done, right? Clear learning goals, providing clear feedback, uh, modeling, scaffolding, opportunities to revise and resubmit, you know, whatever it is that we figure out has that highest impact on student learning. They said, no, I'm gonna make sure that happens, okay? Then they also had students, by the way, who had access to devices and to Wi-Fi. If, if students don't have access to devices or Wi-Fi, when we switch to remote, it's very hard for those kiddos to be successful, obviously. But also you had instructors or teachers that had the know-how, the training, and often professional development in how to use a blended approach. In other words, how to do some of it face-to-face and how to be able to do it in an online environment as well and have those two complement each other. And some teachers just completely flopped, stalled out and didn't do anything for the rest of the semester in public schools and also in universities because one or many of these things were missing. We likely will have some opportunity to interact with our students face to face, even during a COVID type crisis. There will be some opportunities to uh, uh, interact face-to-face -face and others that are going to have to take place online. It'll be a very much a blended learning approach. And blended learning means where these are going to complement each other. It's not this or this or this on Monday and this on Tuesday. It's more where these are complementing each other. And as we think through what tools to use and how to use them, we're also going to be cognizant. Are we using it just for substitution, the videos? Are we using it to augment the tool, augment the task because it has a little bit more functionality? Are we starting to transform or modify the task itself because of the technology? Or are we able to completely redefine it and access a global audience and get kids in contact with other individuals, experts in the field because of the technology that's been created? So for example, let's take a look. So we used to have kids type in the computer lab on Word, save it, print it, right? Now we can use Google Docs. Ooh, if we just switch from Microsoft Word to Google Docs, all we've done is really substituted. The technology is just a direct substitute, really no functional change. But we can also take Google Docs and maybe start to access some of this functional improvement functional improvement. In other words, I could turn on the little voice to speech recognition feature. And for a kid who really struggles with typing, he or she could just dictate it out loud, get all their thoughts down. And then we could go back and start to proofread and edit that. So that's an added functional improvement that we didn't have before voice to text software and, and plugins. Okay. But we could also say, what if we 
use the, the same thing, this Google Docs in a way that actually starts to modify, you know, starts to have some significant task redesign. In other words, you are all going to work on this assignment and three of you are going to be working, you'll all be in teams. I want you to take that document and I want you to share it with each of your teammates. So you're all working on the same document. Now, as you work through it from here, there, wherever you work on it, but put in the comments, put any changes and those comments will go to anybody else who's sharing the document. You get live feedback. Make sure you resolve those comments when you work through those types of things, where you're able to work and collaborate from different places and have real time feedback and interaction. That's starting to redesign the task. It goes from um, a single author to digital co-authorship and co-editing. Okay. We're starting to redesign the task, but what if we took all of that, all of that. Okay. And then we put it into a multimedia presentation that, that we shared and pumped out, not just to our classmates, but we actually came up with like a Ted talk night, whatever we're researching or coming up with, we do a Ted talk night and we host that via live stream and record it so that our students whose parents are overseas in the military or aren't able to watch that they're able to access it from their phones or anytime they want. And then we, we invite comments from the community on the topics that we've presented. Okay, then we're getting into redefinition. It's not about the tool that we choose. We're still using Google Docs for these three right here, right? But it's, it's about to what degree we employ the tool to either substitute, augment, modify, or redefine what's going on.